Hi, it's my second day here at the Haven taking the inner activist training course and it was a packed day. We did a lot of stuff today. Um, you can see the Haven behind me. I'm just gonna move it. Okay, so you can see a little bit. Really a gorgeous spot. I'm looking out at the ocean right now reflecting a lot about all the things I learned today, some of which were extremely painful. Um, because we were looking at biases and stereotypes and marginalization and our responses to those things, which are always pretty complicated. At least if you're me, I don't know. I shouldn't speak for everybody, remember? Um, one of the things that we discussed this morning was, what is power anyway? What do we mean when we talk about power? Are we talking about equality, empowerment, power over, power with, power as a tool that we can do things with? Um, one of the ways in which it was described that was kind of useful was in terms of a rank that shifts and changes according to the context, according to the situation and the people that you're involved with at that particular point in time. And that appeals to me because I've never thought of power as something fixed. It's something that sort of shifts and changes. You get more of it or less of it, as the case may be, depending on your situation that you're in. The other thing that I thought was really useful um, was this distinction that was made between social power and personal power. And as activists, we're usually used to dealing with social forms of power, categories that are contingent on things like race, class, gender, physical ability, uh, age, um, you know, your sexual orientation, um, your position. Um, you know, socially, and also, you know, local forms of power. Uh, maybe something that's a little less scrutinized, like who's your group and what kind of position do you hold in that group? Do you have seniority to people who everybody know your name? Are you comfortable interacting uh, with the folks in your group? Do you understand the social norms that are being used um, and the forms of communication? Uh, do you have a grip on those? And if you do, then you have a kind of power. That's still social power. What I thought was interesting that we were asked to reflect upon that I never really thought about applying to my work as an activist at all was uh, personal power. So, you know, by personal power, let me just refer to my notes here. Uh, personal power involves emotional fluidity, resilience, uh, your ability to uh, relate interpersonally, insight into self and others, perceptions, how you handle your perceptions, equanimity in the face of conflict, and I need more of that, um, and then spiritual power as well. All, you know, these are things that give you strength and give you resilience. So if you have a sense of connection to something transcendent or a sense of detachment, have if you've survived something like a, like a near-death experience or perhaps, you know, you're a survivor of a, a serious illness or something like that, and a sense of purpose in life. Uh, these are things that are powerful and not things that I had hitherto considered to be exceptionally relevant to my activist work, but upon further reflection, I can see how that is so. Um, we were then asked to look at bias and this got kind of painful for me because the case that was used was uh, we were asked to sort of brainstorm stereotypes around third world and then Pakistan, India, and this was getting closer to home for me. And then, uh, oh, Islam and Muslim, and I was like, ouch, 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 all of these stereotypes start pouring out and I'm saying things like, eh, family and uh, caring and, uh, you know, charity and there was a sort of barrage of stereotypes in my little stories that didn't match those at all, didn't really do much, but, you know, I tried to get myself out of the sense of self-pity by thinking, well, it's only an example and, you know, it could equally well be disability, categories of disability here that, for example, would be you know, stand in for these categories that trigger all of these stereotypes and make me feel so marginalized. Um, and so I was trying to picture that instead. Um, and so I thought one of the things that that led us into was the discussion of systemic bias and how really systemic bias is so unconscious. It hides in our blind spots and we're not aware of it. In fact, there's a, a Harvard project online that you can go. It's called a Harvard Project 
of implicit bias and Google it and you can go and check out your bias. Because um, the thing is, is that we all carry bias. None of us are immune. Even non-dominant groups are, you know, women, people of color, people with disabilities. Uh, ever. None of us are free of bias. We all carry it. it. It would be impossible not to in the kind of societies we're living in. However, um, the non-dominant groups are generally a little more impacted. Oh, I hate that word. By, I guess that works. Um, impacted by... Uh, bias as compared to dominant groups that enjoy relative privileges and power, as we all know. Um, and then, you know, the stereotypes that come out of bias are neurological imprints and that are particularly resistant to change because we look for things that confirm our biases. We're comfortable with things that confirm our biases and our thoughts just tend to travel down those well-worn pathways that we've created and part of that society, part of that's media, part of that's you know peer groups and family. And so the trick is how do you change those pathways? How do you challenge those imprints? And we were offered some techniques for doing that, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, we have to pay attention to our biases first thing and uh, including our internalized biases. And then how do you reduce bias through diverse role models, through relationships that are different, um, through intention and commitment to working on bias, through, through being able to observe and notice a discrepancy between your stated intentions and your actually actions, your phobias, your fears, the things that you do that, you know, sort of belie your good intentions in terms of trying to be uh, inclusive. Um, and mindfulness, meditation, they say helps, but, you know, if you don't do meditation, just being sort of aware of your breathing, your body, how you're feeling, what you're thinking about in a particular situation. Uh, legislation makes a difference and diversity and decision making these are the classic struggles for you know civil rights and equality um, and a conscious subtle challenging of stereotypes apparently changes these neurological pathways sort of switches them and uh, carves out a new channel for your thoughts to flow so if you make different associations if you counter the stereotypes and not just by positive stereotypes you know not just by you know stereotypes that are equally inauthentic um, about particular people, but by associating them with positive concepts and thoughts and words like family, safe, um, caring, good neighbors, blah, 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 that you get the, the idea. Those, those apparently, if you repeat them, carve out uh, neurological pathways that are different and that work to reduce your biases, which I thought was really cool. Um, so, you know, having been given some positive techniques for breaking down those biases and stereotypes, um, the, it then becomes important to recognize, you know, the dynamics of in-groups and out-groups. And uh, the in-groups are people who are most like ourselves. They're the people we're most familiar with. They're the groups we're taught to associate with and care about. And uh, we share the same sense of normal with, the rules of the game. You'll recognize this maybe among fellow activists. You know, we all have our in-groups. The out-groups are the people we view as completely different. And the interactions with them create discomfort. We judge them more harshly. Um, we demand more of them. And we forgive them a lot less. So I thought that that was really interesting in terms of power in in-groups and out-groups. Because all groups are not created equal. Obviously, there are in groups that are they're you know way more powerful than other groups but they all have this dynamic and you know the dominant groups hold the systemic power and the norm where by the norms and practices of, of one group are considered to be vastly superior so we then went into an exercise which i don't i think i'll save for the next blog because it's really interesting and i think i need somebody else to help me with it maybe i'll try to you know corral one of the facilitators but I'm finding this extremely interesting and exhausting and I hope you're finding it interesting as well take care